Dan and I, who Dan's on the line here, we're talking Hello. about video games and what we wanted to know what you were playing these days. Uh, that's a great question. That's been a kind of mostly all book all the time, but no, that's not true. Uh, so I've been playing this Pinocchio game, Lies of Peace. Oh, There's, shit. Yeah. You know it's, that one? It's yeah. extremely good. And like, at first I was like, are these guys like weird Marxists and like possibly actually very specifically Benjaminian Marxists? And by the end, I was like, oh, they 100% are. And that's so weird. Um, like, it's very, very good. And it plays all the fairy tale stuff. But it also is like, yeah, it, it I, I could sing its praises. And we just started uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And a million, I'm always playing on like a million different things. Nice. But it hasn't been the heaviest period because of other obligations. Can I ask, have you played Helldivers 2 yet? No, it's not really. You know, I know you guys are shooters guys and multiplayer guys. I really don't like shooting games and I don't really like multiplayer games. Oh, that's, that's that fair. Uh, I am like always down. Don't worry. And I would buy Helldivers if it was like part of a thing. I've only seen the ad and it does actually look pretty fun. But also I have to say, uh, you know, as someone who loves playing video games, all this stuff that like I look at something like Helldivers and I'm just like, this is designed to eat my life. Yes, that's true. And I actually don't find the fun like I know you, I think find a lot of fun in like, like building out your like what your like COD characters, your main guy, right? Yeah, but the grind can be fun. Yeah, I still can't believe the acronym is COD. To me, I'm just like this isn't fun. Like even like for games I do like that like are like that. I'm just like I'd rather be experiencing something that is more interesting. I remember it, Jay, this conversation <laughs> that we were having because like as you know. There's only one video game that I like, and it is Bit Trip oh, Runner. Bit Runner. Bit Trip Runner. And Those incredible. guys are making games again. I know. Really I know. Exciting. I'm, and I still haven't liked any of them as much as Bit Trip yeah, Runner. Yeah, I think they're like trying but, to do a return to form. And, and they're like very explicitly informed by psychoanalysis the, those really? the people that, oh that's right that make those I forgot about yeah, yeah, that. yeah. that's a great but point. i remember in that that kind of era you were trying to explain to me because i was like i was like tell me why somebody does like world of warcraft like what is oh, what is yeah. the pleasure and i remember this conversation really clearly because um, we were talking about it about you know with a mutual friend who at that point was like really really deep into it and you said to me something like, look, in real life, harvesting mushrooms is terrible. But for like an enormous suite of people, like just being in the game and, and harvesting mushrooms is like this extreme source of pleasure. Yeah. And I was like, but right. make it make it make sense. You know, I, I got to I got to offer something here, too. Like I never I never like World of Warcraft. Right. But I don't know if I've told you this story, Jay. So I think it's, it's, it's germane for several reasons. But OK, uh, sure. Listen, but it, it's back in like. Yeah, it's 2005. It's the winter of 2005. And I am in, of all places, uh, Xi'an, China, right? So in, in the far west. Awesome. And, and yeah, it was a good time. It was a good time. And I was having some friends. You know, it just at some point I had to send an email home, right? And this is still, like, I, we had access to a satellite phone occasionally for via my boss. But, like, like it started to go to an internet cafe, right? Sure. Remember those days? Yeah, so I, I I paused from having my business cards cut by hand, which was again thinking about you on a variety of levels here in your book about like these sort of like different ways in which like the ostensible utility of a given technology can be sort of taken from a context and used in another and all mm -hmm, these sort of mm -hmm, asymmetrically distributed ways, right? Where it was like I brought in my material on it like for this new job I had on a USB card with like the various like copyrighted images and whatnot to this local print shop. And they had a hacked version of the latest version of Acrobat or whatever. Uh, and they made me beautiful business cards. But when they came to be printed out, it was actually cheaper for them to have like the three old women who worked there come in from the back and just begin slicing the business cards manually with like these <laughs> giant like double handed Dow things. So that was sure, like, cheaper. Yeah, I got it. But then but then so, so like while they're doing this, I got to go send an email. So I go upstairs into the internet cafe and i should say that we're right uh, opposite one of these universities that's just been built there one of these brand new universities that like they build in six months and that is just an enormous sort of like enterprise and 
So I walk into this internet cafe, which is enormous, like three or 400 terminals easily. Right? Sure, easily. Yeah, great. Every single one is, is occupied or rather- Oh, by a gold farmer? Students are gold farming on yeah. two terminals at a time, yeah. just yeah. clicking mice yeah. as their avatars in the World of Warcraft world are harvesting gold, which they will then sell for real money for, uh, you know, digital yeah. for, for tuition. And the whole place, the thing was like, it was the sound of all these, some of them had headsets on, some of them didn't. There was all this like, like pop playing too, but, but the thick cigarette smoke and the continual clicking and the sounds of these orcs grunting, it was so, it was like, oh, this is a kind of future, I guess. But it was not, it was completely untethered from logics of any sort of teleological progress, but even just like a, a, a legible, like even cyberpunk aesthetics to me. I was like, where is extraction taking place here? Like people are no, getting no, no, black no. It's like mining a, digital currency. Well, like, it's a like, step towards the dream, right? The dream is, <laughs> and in fact, I do talk about this in the book, right? Uh, is like you restart a defunct power plant, often you know, coal, hydro, whatever. Uh, and you plug it directly into video cards. You take out the middleman, plug it directly into video cards and make crypto. The fastest way to turn something useful into something useless. to Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Blanchfield. And today I am especially delighted to introduce our guest, Ajay Singh Chaudhary. Ajay is the executive director of the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research and a core faculty member specializing in social and political theory. He has written for The Guardian, The Nation, The Baffler, N Plus One, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among others. A Jay's brand new book on the politics of climate change, The Exhausted of the Earth, Politics in a Burning World, is now available from Repeater Books. And I will say that it is that book that we invited a Jay to talk about with us today, in particular the section on the concept of resilience. And we will drop in the show notes, the excerpt that you all can read from The Baffler. Uh, bef but I also want to say that um, in addition to being, you know, a friend and, uh, and comrade, uh, Jay and I have been working together for geez, how long now? Uh, am I allowed to talk yet? You're allowed to talk. Oh, cool. Uh Oh, well over 10 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, like we did stuff before Bisser and then Bisser is now 12, 12 years old. Yeah. Easily. So, so we founded a school together. We went to grad school together. We did our first Bisser podcast before the first class. So that was 13 years ago. Yeah. So in some, <laughs> we're old, but also we have been doing, <laughs> we've been, we have been collaborating intellectually on everything from, you know, I've, I learned so much from you about political theory and I talked your ear off about affect theory, which I'm very happy to see made its uh, way I, into I, the book. The big portion of the book and you're credited as my teacher for it. Without further ado, um, Jay. <laughs> Welcome to Ordinary Unhappiness. Abby, Pat, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. Well, we're really happy to talk with you. So good to see the you. Book is, the book is fantastic. We are going to focus on two parts of it that are particularly salient to the concerns of, of this podcast, right? Okay. Um, but before we get into details, I want to make sure we do some ground clearing for our audience. So can you tell us a little bit about the argument of the book as a whole and also about your political stance as you approach the issue of climate change? Um, you situate yourself in the opening to the book as a heterodox Marxist, and you call yourself, uh, quote, radical climate change realist. So tell us, what, what does it mean to situate yourself in that way exactly? And while we're doing ground clearing, 
Can you tell us a bit about one of the other really essential terms in your book, what you call the extractive circuit? Oof, thank you so much. This is great stuff. So yeah, you know, it's funny. I try to write in the in the beginning, you know, I, I did a weird uh, structure for the book, right? Uh, I skipped uh, doing like a standard intro like you would for an academic text mm-hmm. and instead wrote this very narrative prologue. And yeah. then the first chapter kind of just doubles as an intro. But it's also the argument as to why climate is political. And the way I'd use that phrase realism and, you know, it, when you, would, and we, we, you know, we talked a little bit before and, and Abby sent questions along and, and it's funny. I do say heterodox Marxists. I do that for two reasons. Yeah. I also then later say uh, the sort of orthodoxy and heresy or like straight and heterodox is kind of bullshit for, for Marxism uh, in particular. But, uh, the reason I I focus on the realism idea mm-hmm. is basically building off of uh, the work of a lot of people uh, in political theory um, who have been theorizing uh, radical realism. Uh, and uh, probably the most famous person uh, in this sort of school of thought is Raymond Joyce. Yeah. Uh, but there's many, 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 many others. And uh, so by realism, I don't mean the like, really shitty version of real. I, I try to do like almost a textbook thing in the book, right? Slowing down saying it, right? Um, so I don't mean the like shitty version of realism, which is like uh, uh, like the institutions of American democracy are sacrosanct and you must always work within those institutional parameters, uh, right? That's not really my jam, uh, nor am I in fact in, uh, using he- in these terms, right? In these political stance terms, um, realism to denote like, the Lukashian, right? The like social realism, mm-hmm. right? Realism in that sense, right? And there's a million other ways. And I try to use realism as also as a way into talking, basically teaching. A lot of the book I thought, I hope was teaching. Very pedagogical. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. Right? Uh, folks about ideology, right? So there's other ways of thinking about, oh, right, what I think is realistic isn't in fact what everyone thinks is realistic. And oh, I my idea of what's realistic changes over time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one, uh, realism in the sense that I want to use it, so radical climate realism, left-wing climate realism, et cetera, emancipatory climate policy, I use various terminologies um, in it in the book, is realistic in two senses, taking seriously, right, uh, organization of social force, right, as as uh, over-conflicting, often mutually exclusive positions. To me, that's actually a pretty nice definition of politics, right? That's what politics is. It doesn't mean that both sides are equal. Both sides have the same problems. Both sides have the same, right? It's not that sort of weird new new populism language, right? Um, it's a little bit more old school, right? But I also love it because I do think th- there's also a way I'm slipping that back into the sort of radical and, uh, and Marxist and other radical discourses, which is to say, we do actually have to be realists about biophysical limitations yeah. about climate change about these things that i had to learn from other people right i'm not uh i'm not a science doctor one thing i found really well as you were just saying about sort of the work of these science doctors uh <laughs> or and the empirics right uh, yeah I, part of what i found really bracing and clarifying both in the way that your book is just sort of delivers this but also in the way in which you position the concept of realism as you're walking us into it now mm-hmm. is that you have an entire chapter of uh to, you know the best i can tell and it's certainly extensively end note uh like cited yes, I, uh, I was very end note heavy <laughs> but it's an account that's a virtue a fairly sweeping and, and clear-eyed account of all the different sort of goals and standards and agreements and timelines that various international bodies have described Mm. as being necessary, how those have been articulated in terms of their realistic feasibility of various institutions adapting to them, um, that these are like realistic goals and what will be realistic consequences, et cetera. Oh, yes, yes. And what you essentially walk through it, through, through all these examples are, are one, the fact that many of the these goals are actually not realistic and in fact have already been surpassed. Yeah, yeah there's this kind of logic stuff going on here. And two, that you want to be realistic about like this sort of sham realism, but also not immediately fall into like a reactionary kind of like yes. realism, like, well, things are only going to get worse. 
Thanks, Pat. You're a better reader of me than me. We've proved death of the author. Well, no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying it's, it's very good for us as, as people with like <laughs> no, analytic orientations it. that there's something about the way in which you're like, here are all these kettle logics of being like, well, we're all going to try to hit like two, what is it? Like two degrees, right? Three degrees. And here's all these ways we're going to do it. Also, we're already past Except those that. guys often just say we're going to do three. Yeah, we're, we, yeah it's, it's a whole series of like, shall, we, we offer multiple reasons why we can't do anything, but actually that inertia serves, well, this thing you call the extractive circuit. And I just I just thought it was so yeah. legible, at, yeah. at least in terms of psychodynamics, but in terms of like these broader like defense mechanisms for well, maintaining a certain set of systems, but also for like giving a vision of what what's like a motivated vision of reality. Like it's it's both a reality principle in the sense that there actually are finitudes or like systems of actual extraction happening, but also it's like a fake reality because it's constantly talking about goals that are impossible yes. or about inevitabilities that actually aren't. The only thing that I would add is A, that's correct. And also, yes, that was also purposeful. Like there's something very funny to me about being told things like, so something like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is one of the oldest uh, for, for modern climate, sort of like it's pre-Paris, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, although it actually still is operative uh, uh, in all that Paris stuff. And I talk, I go through Paris quite detailed in the book. Um, but yes, there is an ironic quality yeah. um, to the use of realism there. Because yes, often what we are told from that sort of, com I gave a caricature version of like sort of the institutional poli sci realism, right? But often we are told that that's realistic. Like, oh, these, look at these treaties, like nice realistic. And then yeah, you start putting it next to like actual scientific data. And, uh, and the science guys often are, uh, uh, science guys, the scientists. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and there are many different kinds. And they all agree, with, I think, with what I write. Although I did really, really try to play within the boundaries of what I could see as being consensus. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy to have at least one reviewer who was a natural science person who was like, yeah, yeah close enough for jazz. You know, like, <laughs> and like, yeah, to me, it's almost like a, it is a funny, weird form of ideology critique to just throw like this hilarious empirical data and be like, this position is lunatic. And not just lunatic because it disagrees with my values and my politics, but literally like it doesn't do the very thing it says it's going to do. Right. So I could. So I'll use my lingo. Right. Like like I would call that a form of a weird form of imminent critique. But yes, it is also, I think, psychoanalytically, uh, a this this kind of um, yeah, testing the reality principle. I mean, you guys are better on that terminology than I am. Well, there's something also that's, I mean, ironic about the idea that if we're playing with the word realism, that there would be such a thing as left wing climate realism and right wing climate realism. Uh, you anticipated right? what I was all wanted to add. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that stuff comes simply because I actually do think that and I make this argument in the book, I think we've moved past the era of denialism, really. Yeah. And often I don't even think denialism was really 100% denialism. And here I do, in fact, draw on a heavily psychoanalytic ar argument from Carrie Marie Norgard about different kinds of denialisms of different kinds. And like, it's only like, for her, like the first version, right? That is like genuine, I deny reality, I am a skeptic about all things it's like, like, and she's actually, I think, correctly points out in her case study, but which is, I think, Norway, uh, but also in history, that that's actually a, a fairly rare <laughs> position. And often it's this other kind of stuff where it's like, yeah, I, like I see what's happening, but I'm just going to like ignore it, for example, or I'm going to like use a pretty word that helps me ignore it or something like that. Right. And when I was doing the research and thinking about this book, you know, uh, I've been thinking about this stuff and writing and research for a very long time. It was just very obvious to me that I think Abby and I have already talked about this a hundred times in the past, right? There is no like magic molecule that's like the good, yep. <laughs> right? Are you right, forgetting finally... DMT, the spirit molecule? <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, dude. Wait a minute. What if we got everybody to a big room and <laughs> and we debated the issues, and then we met the fairy, the green fairy? Is it or, or is no, it the machine absent. elves? It's or, the machine elves. The machine elves are, okay, yeah, yeah. I, you know what, I hear they'd love to see us. Terrence McKenna says, <laughs> generally speaking, they're very happy to Look, see us. Look, I got no trouble with these cats. Like, they can, like, uh, well, some of them end up being really gnarly, actually. But, like, the elves or these thinkers? <laughs> no, thinkers. Like, <laughs> okay, take drugs, kids. Drugs, kids are good. Don't do drugs. 
If you're doing it, stop it. Get some help. So yeah, there's like not like one single molecule that you can find that gives you the truth, right? So like the arguments against scientism, right, as a sort of way of thinking about the world, right, that like you can find the answers to all questions, social, individual, political, um, in addition to, say, physical, biological, et cetera, through the natural sciences, like, uh, is a crazy idea. I actually don't think very many people actually still believe it. It's like the key to all mythologies in Middlemarch. It does, it's I think not except real. for like Sam Harris, who comically is a very bad scientist. Uh, I don't think anyone actually believes this shit anymore, but whatever. Uh, or anyone who I care a shit about, at least. Um, but that's that being said, uh, I did see a phenomenon that surprised me at first because of how much um, mainstream discourse often says, well, the, there is, in fact just basically this like on off switch on climate, right? Right, That it's like, we do climate and you believe in this house, we believe the science or like you don't do climate in this house, we don't believe the science. And uh, yeah, you got your Donald Trumps who are like, this is Chinese conspiracy, right? And you've got your people who, like Bolsonaro, I think I talked about him in the book, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. who are uh, absolutely, they are personally climate skeptics, but the guys who work for them, the businesses that fund them, they're not, they're like, they're actually freaking out a bit. They're looking at the same data. I say this straight, straight, I think in the first chapter, right? They're looking at the same data, looking at the same lines Mm -hmm. and like, look at US military projects, right? It's like, how are we going to make our ships float in a different uh, composition of seawater? How are we going to protect our planes with different uh, exposures to things? Um, When fuel has to change from X to Y, we'll do this. So people working on that kind of stuff, they're often quite right wing. They're very uh, clear eyed about stuff. Um, A lot of the push I argue in the book around, I think this is actually a fairly safe argument at this point, um, around border stuff, it it jives with all kinds of important long histories of border management, but not as old as people think. Like modern border management, right? It's only like a century or plus old, right? But right, I do think that people are looking at it and they're like, oh yeah, there's going to be a billion refugees, so we better shore up these lines. We better make sure... You know, there's some clean like air for my people, right? So certain areas will be cleaner. You get issues of environmental racism, right? And then you get into all kinds of these funny examples they use with like insurance and stuff. But the long story short, right, is um, and these are very minor. You also see very hor- horrifying versions of this elsewhere. Um, that you in fact have uh, what I call right wing climate realism, which is uh, simply like right wing think. Not just thinkers, right wing actors. And here I usually mean firms or owners of firms, i.e., I mean, Marxist terminology, uh, bourgeois, um, but not only. And then also, you know, representative right wing politicians and and intelligentsia uh, who are very like, yeah, they're like, yes, climate change is real. It's happening. And therefore, like, keep out the darkies or therefore uh, we should have a... uh, permanent uh, siege and sanction regime on various global South countries because of the voracious uh, appetites of these, of these, these yellow, brown, and black hordes, right? Like, I'm sorry to be so... No, I mean, I think it's, it's very clear that you're ventriloquizing or, or paraphrasing what they say. Yeah, okay. And, I yeah, just yeah, we don't like hear that as coming from... I want to say one thing on this point. What we're talking about here more broadly, I think, or one way to give our audience a handle if we're thinking about this, are sort of like systems of ideology or systems of processes essentially of psychological adaptation or our capacity to normalize certain things through like in the given, et cetera. Yes, right? I think that's a wonderful way of putting it. This abuts and, and interfaces with the material in a very real way insofar as that, as you're saying, like it doesn't really matter that like whether or not someone on the right now comes to or ever will be articulate, yes, I acknowledge the truth of climate change. I've had like, I don't know, a, a come to Greta Thunberg moment in, in my heart or something, right? It, it, what in come fact, Jesus. there's actually a functional apparatus that the, the right wing is behind. And that, you know, as you indicate, there's already a ton, ton of liberal consensus around it, which is functionally to deal with the problems of climate change through legible mechanisms of hard borders, disciplinary control, et cetera. And so part of, I think, what's going on here then and why I, I think you speaking even bluntly, the the neo-imperialist, settler, racist, what have you core of that ideological orientation and what that world looks like is, I think, really crucial because it gets at how when you strip away the layers of mystification from it, 
it actually is more or less a bipartisan or ostensibly yeah. majoritarian and certainly distressingly hegemonic opinion that you find expressed in, I'm thinking here about like my own, like things that, that preoccupy me, like mass shooter manifestos when someone, you know, worries about like great replacement paranoias and, uh, you know, covers of magazines written by, you know, Bush administration officials, like being like, well, how many immigrants is too many? Right. And that yeah. both of these work together to functionally produce something and to produce a type of reality. And, and even if they do position themselves as, well, this is an extreme version of the other thing, or God, how dare you think about the one in relation to the other? And, and you know, the subsequent moves are like, well, now we have to talk about immigrants because at least there's a real issue here. Right. It, you know, it, it's that is actually an ongoing dynamic process of social normalization and of the imposition mm -hmm. of control and of mystifications of other alternatives. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a way I can address this and come back to Abby's original uh, question about sure. the extractive circuit. Mm -hmm. So, yes, like one of the things also that I find powerful about the idea of right wing climate realism, in addition to being just like straight up, the idea that the right is just a bunch of dummies, like, oh, my God, no. Uh, and like the captains, of, and sometimes they're Elons, but sometimes they're Jeff Bezos's and Jeff for all of his faults. And believe me, I catalog them. He's not a dumb guy. So, and then I, you know, I have the big, the Rex Tillerson one where I'm just like, and I use him as a principal example, just to be like, right, right. He goes straight from Exxon basically into the Trump administration. Now he's, I think, semi-retired, but like still probably gets plum, you know, seats and contracts, whatever. Right. But like, even if Rex Tillerson did have your come to Greta Thunberg moment, right. They just fire him and find a new guy <laughs> to be the new Rex Tillerson. Right. Like it's yeah. like, there's like an endless parade of these assholes. And one of the reasons why I get so extreme with the like uh, racialized and, and colonial imagination sort of language is, is because, in fact, uh, one of the other sort of big, big theory of there's a lot of like, as Pat and Abby were pointing out, right, there's a lot of like, I try to make things as empirical and historical as I can in the book, but there are these, a lot of big abstract concepts. And one of the big abstract arguments is, in fact, that uh, stuff like when you read Rosa Luxemburg, for example, on her early writings and accumulation of capital on like colonization as, and like how it differs from exploitation in the metro in the metropole, right? Or you read I mean, Fanon, right? It's a huge touchstone for me, mm -hmm. right? It often says, right, there's a level of mediation, the same argument, in fact, they're mirror arguments, right? There's a level of mediation in right. let, sort of regular exploitation versus the direct violence of the colony. Uh, and there's always been that boomerang argument. Then there's also been always a parallel argument that, right, there's, of course, um, always ongoing sort of uh, colonization and racialization in sort of pockets at home, not just historically speaking, where people will be like, oh, of course, the Americas, for example, are founded on colonization, settler colonialism, genocide, etc. But ongoing sort of processes and sort of pockets. One of the key arguments that I have, and I think this bleeds over into that extractive circuit question, is that, in fact, there's a kind of colonial drain argument um, that applies not only in the most abstract sort of macroeconomic sense or political economic sense to colonization as those kinds of people were talking about it, um, but it frankly applies to people who, the way I usually phrase it in verbal language as opposed to my book, is like people who never expect it have like guns pointed in their face who never expected the carceral state to land on them quite right. so hard. Right. Um, and, you know, just yesterday, right here in New York, I was on the subway and there's dudes with guns everywhere. National that's not the first time in my life. That's true. But right. I, I don't mean like criminals. Uh, crime is very down actually here. Yeah. I don't know why we keep pretending otherwise, but like soldiers, right. From, from the, the, the national guard. The national like, guard. Yeah. Fuck. Right. So this kind of phenomenon, uh, I talk in the book about like one in four employees being involved in some kind of like security or surveillance job in, in a lot of parts of North America. This kind of thing, I think, is is quite new to a lot of folks. This kind of and in weirdly, again, this come, maybe comes back to the heterodox stuff and all that stuff, because I actually think this relationship is is much more common than, say, the sort of tier different forms of exploitation that many people from my intellectual background usually sort of focus on. So there's this broadening colonization. And then when I, the second uh, chapter, which Abby 
pointed out, right, is sort of very crucial. In fact, it's funny. It's the shortest in the book, but I actually think of it as being the uh, engine of the book. Is this attempt to draw in both like, I, I only do one commodity, really. I really focus on the cell phone, but that's also the, the commodity that is usually described in both like mainstream and critical literatures. That's the sort of that's a good example of the way production happens in the model world. And I try to present it in as cold a way as possible, but also right to sort of plug that picture um, in as global a way as I can within the parameters with all the sort of uh, na- <laughs> ecological, the, the the situating that picture of global economy, of of macroeconomic stuff and politics within, right, its ecological category. So we're actually looking at where stuff comes from, where it goes, how this changes politics. And uh, in doing that, it brings us back to those categories again, because, right, you see value extraction, obviously, from natural inputs, right? And this could be something where there's not enough of something. So uh, marine fisheries is a really good example, right, are, are being decimated. So it can be a, a problem of classic scarcity. Um, but it can also be actually weirdly a problem of abundance, uh, but abundance of bad things, right? One a thing we are actually not running out of. Pache arguments 20, 30 years ago is oil. We got plenty of that shit, plenty of oil, plenty of gas, plenty of coal. We got plenty of fossil fuels. We, our, our problem is that we have, uh, over, we have, there's an overshoot. There's only so much that the biophysical limitations can take. And a lot of what I call right wing client realism is let's make sure that that machine either keeps running. And if that costs us a billion people and we can keep going, okay. And like, there's a weird way where I say that that's rational, but for me, rational doesn't equal good, right? Um, uh, Irrational also doesn't equal good. Dialectics, kids, very important, (laughs) right? Like, uh, there's a weird way in which that's rational. You're like, okay, I lose a billion people. I already kind of have a surplus population, but you're saying I can do that and things get a little, yeah, they get a little rough, but I'll live in some kind of comfort and I'll get to keep my power and wealth. So yeah, I like that. I want to do that, right? That sounds great. That's the Rex position. That's right when climate realism. Uh, and the flip side is all that kind of uh, spreading colonial relations stuff and the you know, exploitation has not gone anywhere, right? Feeds into this whole picture, this very, I call it a vicious cycle uh, in the book of what the extraction is, is simply uh, a shorthand I use for Capitalism in the 21st century in its full social and ecological uh, expression. I think that's the exact definition, I think, close to it at least. Um, And the reason why I want to come back to the sort of colonization and and exploitation stuff is simply that you can actually see those logics at work within that picture in prosaic empirical terms, not in some like hand wavy way, right? If I can displace, and now I guess I am... Not Rex or Rex Sellerson or something, right? If I can displace some labor by killing off a couple, you know, coral reefs, well, fuck, I get some cheap labor. Uh, I might have ideas about which gender and which quote unquote race and whatnot is the most pliant. I might have all kinds of ideas about who I want, where and why, how many people I want to move, right? Like these become they're, like these categories which can seem very distant, I think, from these questions actually become incredibly important in a sort of almost a purely economic way. But there is an economic logic here that is very plain and easy for me to express. Mm-hmm. There's also a desire for dominance. Yeah. 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 That yeah. is harder yeah. to get at, yeah. 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 but yeah. it's very, very important. Yeah. I think this is one of those points where, where I think you have to be able to, well, you use the stereoscopic notion for, for, for Benjamin, right? Like, they need to be able to like toggle between two different ways of looking at the same object, uh, you know, at once or to flexibly move between them where I think you have to have a double, like, uh, you know, political, economic, libidinal economic view of things. Right. Because like mm-hmm. attempting to reconcile the fact that on the one hand, it makes dollars and cents short term, like rationality for, I don't know, the people who we have breaking ships in Bengal to drown. Right to keep bringing yes. those ships down at the last moment until they drown, right? Or to sell Miami real estate that won't be yeah, there. Yeah, that's one of my funniest yeah. examples. Yeah. yeah, in 30 years. Like all these things on, yes, it makes short-term rational 
sense, I guess, for people doing okay with those transactions uh, or like who make out like bandits within it. But also on another level, that doesn't make much market rationality sense, right? When you start thinking about longer term time incentives or in any event, you have to start rethinking what rationality is. And I, I think here of two things, right? I, I think about one, the way in which the quintessential distinction between Marx and Freud or that Freud separates himself from Marx on is that in his sort of prehistory of the human, which has some interesting interfaces with like Engel's theories of the development of the family, et cetera, but that the aggression pre-exists and would be present even without the development of the property form and the property relation, right? And we could talk about what that means for Freud versus Marx, but I think in some ways, one way I take that as being, but opening the door to at least considering in this kind of stereoscopic way Uh is that a feature of the property relation or the property form, which makes property, which like adds a libidinal value to property ownership is the pleasure of dominance. Yeah. Is the pleasure of distribution of resources is the pleasure of being able to treat people like resources. And in other words, like there it's about existing in relation to processes of disposability, whether it's your getting to dispose pe- dispose of people for your amusement or simply writing off certain people as inevitably disposable because of indifferent historical processes or like, you know, I don't know, think of that classic uh, Matt Iglesias line, like it's okay that some places have different standards for sweatshops and, you know, fire prevention than do others. That's how I get my ties is basically like more or less what he argues. Uh, with that specific example, right? So, so like, I think in, in in those cases, right, what we're talking, yeah, I want to recommend people's uh, Jeb, Jeb Lund's takedown read of that is pretty amazing. Uh, it's, I think that should follow Matt Iglesias wherever he goes. But like, it's this surplus of pleasure. What what I'm finding so interesting about the extractive circuit here too is, that, and, and this dynamic that you're talking about, is that it's also about extracting labor from people, but literally extracting affects, extracting the last of what people yeah. have, making them go yeah. a little bit further. And then part of that also produces that ever bit more that could be kind of like chiseled out of a human being becomes yes. a type of source of pleasure, can be seen as a proof of, of optimized joy for some someone else <laughs> in the system. And, and the image I want to go here, which is even darker than some of the other ones, is I think of like, is, is it Tertullian's vision of hell or heaven rather, where you get the windows, you're in heaven. Oh, it's part very of the pleasure. important that you also be able to look into hell. Yeah, basically. And you see you your have enemies a burning. Yeah. And you have a gate. You- I remember him being a dick. I don't yeah. remember that. I think this is a couple of the early yeah. church fathers. I think this might be an Irenaeus as well. That you like look down on the burning people and are like, fuck off, asshole. What would be the, the real pleasure of the system? It's not just that it punishes these people. It gives you the surplus of like, literally they're being extinguished. Like they're, they're on fire and they're burning to death. And part of the warmth that they shed is like metaphorically illuminating your day. And what would heaven be if not for that little pleasure of knowing that you are not in hell. And if you choose, you can watch them burn or you can just pull down the blinds. So, Jay, a few minutes ago, you know, I, I heard you hedging and I've heard you hedging on the like, I don't have much of a background in psychoanalysis, whatever. Yeah, I know. Um, right. But I think and I think this is not only because I've read your book, but also because I've read your dissertation and because I've been talking <laughs> to you for, for, you know, more than a decade is that. I think you are often very suspicious of some psychoanalytic discourse because you see it as being fundamentally about the individual psyche. But what I want to do is move us to the part of the book where you are already explicitly playing in a psychoanalytic sandbox. Yeah, I am. Because you really are. And it is a version of psychoanalysis that never allows for a conception of the psyche that turns away from the very real other, not just the interjected other. Um, And that, of course, is the psychoanalysis of Frantz Fanon. Mm. And so the title of the book, The Exhausted of the Earth, is an obvious homage to to Fanon, um, to to his landmark 1961 book, The Wretched of the Earth. Um, And I'm going to quote you for a moment, in fact, to this effect. So you write... 
France Fanon's Les Domnes de la Terre, The Wretched of the Earth, taken from the verses of L'Internationale, are today's exhausted of the earth. Climate change is not the byproduct of contemporary capitalism. Your exhaustion and that of the global human ecological niche are fuel for the fire. Our niche has a case of the Mondays. This life, this civilization, is above all exhausting. Business as usual promises only to accelerate your and this world's exhaustion. It can afford to take a leisurely, piecemeal approach. Neither you nor this world can afford that. Neither you nor this world wait for the revolution. Neither you nor this world can abide by liberal admonitions to propriety, to civility, to patience, or compromise. Exhaustion is not some rhetorical gesture, discursive fiction, or new theoretical fantasy. Exhaustion outlines the historical block, the mass political subject of this conjuncture. Close quote. So I wanted to ask you, especially because, you know, many of our listeners are really interested in Fanon and, and we've, you know, we've talked to Nika Siegel about Fanon. We've got some other, other Fanon-centric uh, episodes coming up. But, but this is, you know, it's clearly such a major influence on the entire project of the book. I wanted to ask you, Two questions. One, how Fanon's work informs your thinking. You know, you can take that in whatever direction mm-hmm. you want. And and second, and again, you can probably hear me. This is being trying to be pedagogical and doing some some ground clearing yeah. here. Um, getting at the category of exhaustion, right? The exhausted yeah. of the earth. Why is it that this category of exhaustion is so central to your analysis in the book? Thank you so much. As part of that extractive circuit argument, and I really try to be careful about this because there is this kind of creepy late 19th, early 20th century literatures on like human energetics theories. And it's often actually from um, business management and other kinds of literatures like that, that yeah. these things come up in addition to sort of different forms of psychological discourse in that in that era not just psychoanalysis. And when we're talking about the extractive circuit, one of the things that's being extracted, though, is in fact, basically, it's there is a rational argument that this comes back to what Pat was saying, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't actually think it's just like shareholder return. I do think some of these guys are thinking a century out and they're like, yeah, I think we could probably hold on. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. And And that's a risk. And they're kind of aware of it. But it's like, well, would I rather immediately lose a huge fuck ton of wealth, right? 20 to 100 trillion dollars, right? Something crazy like that, right? Or would I rather roll the dice and there's a good 50% chance that I come out on top? Well, they choose like that. those odds. Yeah. <laughs> they choose, they choose column B, God. right? Column A sucks for them. Column B is pretty good. <sighs> so that is a kind of rationality. And the kind of... Pat, I'm going to quote you on this, right? You said surplus of pleasure. You know, I've been thinking about that kind of stuff a lot after the fact, and it's been coming up at other book talks. Actually, a really, really incisive guy after my DC talk asked this, uh, not at the event, actually, at a thing after, where he was like, geopolitically, this doesn't make any sense. Like, he's not saying my book didn't make any sense, but he's saying like, what you describe, which seems accurate about, for example, what the United States is currently doing is like, that doesn't make market rationality. So are you positing some kind of like geopolitical theory of like white supremacy? And I really had to think about that because that is more that kind of like surplus of pleasure argument, because it in fact doesn't make sense. Like in any way that is purely rational for the U.S. to be doing what the U.S. is doing right now. Sure. And I would also say that- In the sense on, of self-interest. Yeah, in that yeah. yeah, in that kind of self-interest thing that I try to keep to as closely in the book as I can. And it's funny, yeah, I, I do get very nervous talking psychoanalysis, uh, not necessarily for the exact reasons I did 10 years ago, though, because <laughs> when I get into, and I'll come to fun on, like a lot of the psychological material I'll use, I'm pretty promiscuous between- the methods, right? So I sure. mix things from what I call like American empirical psychology. It has a million different ways of doing it. Um, these sort of classic social psychology arguments, and then also psychoanalytic arguments. Um, and of course, like, you know, a couple decades on, 
especially if you read as much like critical theory as I do, it's steeped in psychoanalytic arguments. So like, like that stuff is, is still very important to me. Um, it's not just, I think Fanon is really good at this. It's neither that I can say this is only about the individual, nor is it that I can say this is only about environment and society. Right. Right. Um, it's sort of this triangle, right? And Fanon includes in that is it a triangle. Is it a trapezoid? I'm not sure. Uh, right. He includes in there the clinical experience as well. Right. Um, so, right. This is a lot of things moving at the same time. Now, there are some versions I've encountered. And again, I think you both could speak to this more strongly than I could. And so feel free to interject. Um, the forms of psychoanalysis that do posit this kind of like trans historical, again, I'm very bio, I guess, about these things like brain structure, right? Some kind of trans historical structure of the mind that inheres in the brain. And I do find that hard to parse sometimes. But I've also, you know, read plenty of psychoanalytic theory that tries to take very seriously the idea that historical conditions shift these kinds of basic drives mm -hmm. that do arise from sort of, I think Freud himself would be happy with me saying this, right? He would say have some kind of like biological, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Freud would say that. Um, and I do, on Abby, I think I have to credit you on this one as well. I do think one of the things that's funny about Freud, it's also funny about Marx, actually, is that people uh, get very hepped up about it. It really blows my mind. Um, you know, the like, oh, this is dated, this doesn't have, this doesn't apply. And A, I'm like, sure. So look to the people who have continued developing these forms of thinking. They've revised yeah. and, and it done good work. These are not, neither of these people said they were like prophets off the mountain. They said, take these methodologies and please work with them. Thank you. Okay. Right? Like, I mean, that's a fine, fair thing to say, I, I, I think. And Fanon is one of the people who did that. And yeah. Fanon is so important to me uh, not because I think, and this is actually a, a major argument in the book, not because I think that he's like the, he has all the answers for climate politics. No, he wasn't thinking about climate change. I mean, there are, as I point out, a couple of places where envir interesting environmental stuff comes up. Um, there are some people who've said Fanon doesn't actually work very well. Uh, Rob Nixon is one of the people who said that. I didn't, I don't think that he gets that part right about Fanon. But right, Fanon is really fascinating to me. Uh, for several reasons. One, there is a kind of, I, I think I call it isomorphism in the book, right? Between, so he's dealing with a problem that is arising from a particular historical situation. You can read plenty of people who write on this, but write any particular historical situation. And I would include for anyone who gets their hackles up about this and thinks like Marx is the Bible, like read Marx on the 18th Brumaire or something like that, right? When Marx is actually analyzing a historical conjuncture, he's like, this is a unique set of things that doesn't look anything like the theory, right? Um, so that's a really good example. And Fanon, similarly, you know, I believe he actually even shared a teacher with Guattari, for example. I'd have to go back and check. I think I have a footnote to it somewhere. So his unique position that is so fascinating is, so he's theorizing politically a situation in which there's a tremendous amount of power and it won't be given up. So I think right. of non A as a kind of realist. And I cite a few other people who've yeah. made that argument in the past. And that's the first thing. And then psychologically, sadly, I would say, so often people attribute the psychological theory to its gloss by Sartre. And Sartre's gloss is really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I do not, uh, you know, there's actually some debate, I think, in the literature about whether Fanon approved it or not. As far as I can tell, it's not humanly possible. And I take Beauvoir at her word that uh, he could not read, like he, had, he was no longer verbal uh, when it, it, he was literally on his deathbed when that was delivered. Because the reason I raise this is that the often attributed to Fanon is a psychological idea that violence is this kind of like cleansing force that violence makes us whole. And that like, it's a, it's a funny read. Uh, a, I do think it leads very hard on the Sartre yeah, gloss. It and it also counts on you not reading the rest of the book or any of his <laughs> other stuff. Um, because yeah. in fact, in Fanon, the violent stuff is tragic. It's a tragic necessity. Mm -hmm. And even that sort of, I forget, again, I don't know the words in French, uh, even that whatever cleansing idea or whatever that is, he says that this passes, right? And in fact, what he has to deal with a lot then towards the end is 
how broken and fucked up this leads leads people. Now he's not saying we can we shouldn't do those things because they make people broken and fucked up, but he's like that is the end result, and it's a huge problem. <laughs> And he has a really practical problem that makes this individual social distinction that is often there sort of in the critical left-wing literature towards psych, not the pro, right? That it's not bourgeois always to think about the individual. And why does he say this? Because for, unlike Watari, uh, he has a problem, right? He cannot let the inmates run the asylum right. because he is fighting in a war. So his question is like, like, got a patient. I'm thinking of one of the case studies right now. I forget if it's in Wretched or if it's in the new book that has all the clinical stuff in right. it. But it's like, got a guy in the office and the guy and the guy is hallucinating, basically. The guy is seeing things. And like, Fanon has a question, like, as a doctor, has a question, right? The question is, can I give this person a gun? And the answer is no. Right. I cannot give this, like, guy who is seeing things like weaponry. Yeah. That's not good for the movement. That's not good for him. It's not good for his family. This is a terrible thing. So Fanon is forced into this kind of funny practicality and he is thinking really creatively about how to deal with it. And he's also really interested, and I think, Abby, this connects to a couple of things that you brought up earlier, what in contemporary, more contemporary language we would call like affect, the spillover of affect or how feelings can be a little more broad than, again, a lot of classic so social theory might suggest, right. right? So social position is sort of probabilistically connected to emotion. Uh, I, I'm going to be playing loosey-goosey between feeling affect and emotion. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I know some people get very upset about that, but I it's, think it's okay. It's, I think that's um, fine. A lot of <laughs> theorists play fast and loose between those. I mean, someone else, I feel like that's someone else's topic and they could take me to task if they want that's to. That's fine. We're not going to. So A, I think he's got this wonderful realism. B, there's this isomorphism with the urgency and the way that it's like, oh, actually a lot of people weren't really theorizing decolonization the way he was. I mean, some of his teachers were. So like uh, thinking of people like Cesare, who he quotes a lot, right? There is a wonderful isomorphism uh, between these people who were like, yeah, uh, this political project cannot wait because the feelings that it's generating are boiling over. And we can't like it. That is very, very close, I think, to what we see happening, both consciously, but also unconsciously to bring us back to these fields around climate. And mm. that a lot of things that I see in social crises that I feel like I can rationally describe as connected to climate, and I, tr I do my best to do so, have yet to be had that connection between the, the visceral response and a sort of materially grounded causality argument, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a big one. And that's a big one for Fanon as well. And then going back, I feel like the last thing that is so helpful here is, in fact, in what you read, right, is the fuel for the fire. Yeah. Because the argument isn't just that, like, these things compound, which is a fine argument. I'm not against that. Uh, you know, people can make that argument. Um, in fact, it is like, whether, I mean, this is going to sound, again, very weird juxtaposition, but I try to do these things on purpose in the book, right? Whether we are talking about something as a, just horrifying as like child slavery, right? Which comes up in the book more than once, or we are talking about something as prosaic, I think for many listeners of this show, as using your phone to do work in your technical hours for what you will, right? We are seeing very dramatically different forms of what I would call exhaustion, right? Because we are getting value extraction and that value in turn lets us run things just a little bit faster. And that speed question is so, so important, both on understanding the way thing, the way something like the extractive circuit works, but also in thinking about this political divide between wanting to go fast to make things slow down or wanting to go slow to make things speed up. Right. And uh, here again, I will stray a bit from the psych argument, but I'm happy to come back to it to talk about resilience as you sort of teed it up. In an economic sense, it's a very strange thing because one of the interventions in those like weird, like it's almost again, the on off switch, like on the growth degrowth stuff. And I'm obviously more sympathetic to the degrowth folks. I just want to sort of help them 
along a little bit with what I can contribute, right? Um, but that said, one of the things that's sort of lost there is it's really hard. It's been really hard for a long time. And it's clearly, especially when you look at the ecological data, it's getting harder to, in fact, eke out a little more margin, to eke out a little more growth rate, to eke out these things. So it, like in, a, in this grand sense, you're throwing more Right. That's when I say when I say your exhaustion is fuel for the fire, I actually mean it like and I get into like the politics of it, right? being to be having no time for politics is also convenient. Right. So like there's so many different ways of thinking about it. But at the most fundamental level, right, your productive activity, if it is extending. Right. I think about this all the time because I do it and my own work. Right. I'll do some weird you know, administrative task at three in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, I've just shifted this X amount of money around the world and that produces Y amount of value. They don't care that I'm telling classes about Marx. Like, who? they don't give a shit about that. All that matters is I'm moving large chunks of money from one place to another, right? So like, that is generating value. It is also very bad for me, it is unhealthy for me. And I really wanted people to be connecting on that level. Yeah. And I think, again, this brings us back to Fanon, who also, you know, I think is under theorized uh, as, as someone who is a care professional yeah. and someone who's centering their life's work in care work. So, Jay, ever since the excerpt of your book yeah. in The Baffler came out, which, which came out before the, before the book itself did, yeah. which is actually subtitled Against Resilience, um, and res <laughs> <laughs> we have been really excited to talk to you about, about this word, resilience, that gets, you know, it gets bandied about a lot in psychological circles um and also more broadly in in discourses of wellness you know and that's that's a very <laughs> big word that we're not going to really tackle today but you know i associate <laughs> it with like hr bulletins um, yes i read so much of that crap i know and well i mean you know anywhere else that people are concerned with with us keeping our heads down and extracting our labor, uh, regardless of the human costs, right? And so that that word is resilience. Um, and you take aim at at resilience in the book, um, and in this excerpted chapter, which we will, by the way, link in the show notes. Um, and we have, you know, when we did our episode on the trauma plot yeah. um and Joss Whedon, we ranted a little bit about the fetishization of resilience. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I can actually, yeah. I, yeah. Um, but, but you take this critique to a whole new yeah. level. And Ajay, you also toggle in this really interesting way between thinking about resilience in personal terms and in environmental terms. So yeah, before okay. we get into the critique, this is the short question. I'm going to have a longer question, but can you talk to us and to our listeners about the origins of this term resilience and the story of its, if it's, you know, really rapid rise in the past few decades. Can I make one quick intervention here before we do this piece? I, I, just for the sure. sake, because I know we have a lot of, we have a lot of audience members who are clinicians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly clinicians working with people in situations of extremis or people who have suffered, uh, so it's even like complex traumas and who are also themselves qua clinicians continually dealing with, uh, let's call it the attritive onslaught of, of shit. That I was going to call it vicarious trauma, but yeah, yeah, but I mean like pain and suffering, right? And I, I think with them in mind, and with some of the things they've had to say about resilience, I think I want to just initially make a little bit of space for, uh, or at least ask our, our our audience to contemplate that resilience qua a a feature like a trait that you might be developing and a, a patient might be developing which is a really good thing i.e overcoming something in their lives yeah, or resilience course. is like a practice of how you may function on an individual level when you you know as you put yourself back together again to to repeatedly see you know clients who are are are, are, are depleting but who you care for etc like th that whatever that intersubjective sort of well of restorative whatever that, that threshold is for the capacity of healing and boundaries or whatever that we want to talk about that clinicians need to have is not necessarily the same thing 
as the thing that we're talking about qua resilience, or at least what I'd ask the audience to think about is how the critique that we're about to hear from Ajay of like the institutionalization of resilience and also it's sort of like functionality as a, like a way of organizing subjective experience, but also of masking institutional operations around subjective things is like a thing that's worth hearing and can exist in productive tension or alongside. I'm still filling out paperwork saying that, yes, like this person's fact that they're no longer, you know, they've stopped drinking after the the grievous loss, right? Shows resilience and that's good. We're not saying that all of those things are bad. I just wanted to sort of say that. Yeah. Sure. So yes, uh, resilience is very funny, right? You can't avoid this word in the modern world. I do some very glib things in the book. Like, so in the uh, most recent IPCC report, for example, it appears some like 5,000 times. I actually think this is a semi bullshit method, but it's just like a easy sort of an easy way of thinking about it. It's not that bullshit, I guess. I use that Google like Ngram and Google Trends searches to show that like resilience like was not a popular word, you know, before the 60s, 70s at the earliest. Yeah. So schematically, uh, resilience used to be a very obscure term uh, and it was used principally in metallurgy and it, it almost in the exact way that you would imagine the use of this term. So it's like I can apply X amount of force and Y amount of heat to a given alloy. Mm. And here's where it will bend and here's where it will break given its internal physical properties, Mm. right? So that's like a classic old school. Like if you went around in like the 1920s or the 1820s talking about resilience or things like that, people would have thought that's what you were talking about. Like silver is not so resilient. Yes. Yes. Or like... Ooh, look, we've discovered aluminum. It seems very bendable, you know, oh, like that oh. kind of shit, right? So this is the stories of, of California 49ers finding a nugget. And the way you know it's gold versus pyrite is that the gold will bend a little, yeah, but yeah. the pyrite will chip your tooth or shatter. Yeah, it's funny. When I was doing the research for the book, I discovered the, you know, so IPCC reports are complicated. I don't know how much your audience knows about that. Speaking of glib dismissals, I think there's often too quickly a glib dismissal of IPCC reports. Um, They have huge problems. You know who knows the most that they have huge problems? IPCC authors. I suggest you talk to some of them off the record, folks, if you're journalists or or other folks who want to do that, because they will say different things. Uh, IPCC reports are very... um, (laughs) <laughs> what's the word curated would be the nice way to say it censored is the more accurate <laughs> way to say it uh <laughs> uh right they go through teams of uh government actors of commercial actors all kinds of folks working together basically especially for those headline statements but also some of the inside stuff but crucially they link to all these very good in fact often very useful papers on all kinds, especially on the nat- in the natural sciences, right? And so uh, one of the things I discovered, though, in fact, I should credit two sets of people. One, as Abby knows, I there's a lot of science people in my family. So getting the science wrong would feel bad. And you guys can deal with that psychological dynamic. Uh, the second one that I want to credit, though, is Mackenzie Warwick. And mm. she argued all the way back in 2000, I want to say 14, maybe 13, um, in a, in a, a wonderful book she wrote on climate, it did what theory should do, mm-hmm. which is it provoked further thought and action. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, right? It's that's good theory. Are you talking about the like? I'm talking about uh, molecular red. Molecular like, red. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, there's stuff in here I agree with, stuff I don't, but that's not the point. The mm-hmm. point is she does such a great job pushing. And one of the arguments that she makes is well, if you are a historical materialist, she should probably be interested in the ways in which the natural sciences inform materialism. It doesn't mean it's like an open and shut case. We already talked about that earlier. Right. But right, um, she really suggested uh, and sort of reinforced that idea that, you know, from having read my dissertation, weirdly my, like, studying religion and politics ended me talking about science. And weirdly in this book, talking about science and politics ends me talking about religion. Mm. But right, um, whatever the case may be, right, she makes this wonderful thing that you should be informed by the sciences. So there is a scientific definition that's developed in the 70s. Although I have to say in the research, what I discovered is that uh, A, uh, 
and I, here I just couldn't find a conclusive thing. It, they all do seem to have some kind of root in systems theory in the 50s and things like this. There probably was cross-fertilization between the ecological and then what I'm going to talk about now, which is the subsequent social psychological mm -hmm. definition. Okay. So the 1971 a definition that's often cited in ecology is from C.S. Holling, I believe. And then he refines it over the years. And there is, in fact, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about climate science, and I do really think you know, regular people can read this stuff. I promise you people, that's like a firm conviction of mine. As you were reading the climate science literature, this definition changes. Um, also, climate science, by its very nature, ends up dealing with social issues. It can't avoid it. Of course. Um, and often it's very, and again, I hear a lot of dismissals of, of natural science and of engineering um, and sometimes it's warranted, but uh, uh, in these fields, it, it seems to be producing increasingly, again, uh, <laughs> alarming, but also uh, there will be like full paragraphs that like I'll have students close read them and they'll be like, oh, is this like a natural, this is like an atmospheric chemist saying capitalism doesn't work for sustainability. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. yep, that is true. That is, a, or this is a uh, marine biologist. Like who, and these are not like, like weird crypt, like secret communists. They're basically like nice liberals who have some kind of like basic utilitarianism. They're like, oh, I assume my research is for uh, the greatest good for the largest number. Now sure. I'm not a utilitarian myself, but like, if you start from that premise, people start built like, they're like, well, shit, we can't do this. We can't do this. We should do this. We should, why aren't we doing those things? Right. So these things come out. But coming back to resilience, there's a cross fertilization, but I couldn't really put my finger on it, sadly, mm -hmm. from the resources uh, that were available to me. So the more schematic way is to say, yes, there's the 1971 ecological definition that does bring in social and, um, but especially uh, habitat theory. Mm -hmm. Again, this has a th weird kind of theory of balance in implicit within it. Um, which does make sense for certain kinds of ways if you're thinking about ecological niches and and habitats, right? Um, if you introduce an invasive species that will make uh, that will decimate uh, the functioning of a local uh, zone, that is a good example of decreasing resilience in the ecological sense, right? That's I think that makes sense. I hope to people listening. At the same time, though. And there is a, and I'm not actually, I, I find the hauling thing a little weird, but really weird. And this is where I got into a lot of psychological studies. I could not believe this, honestly, when I first encountered it. And I will tell people how I encountered it, which is if you look at all those references in IPCC reports that are, are about resilience, actually a whole bunch of them are not about like, I don't know, coastal inundation or dangerous heat mm. or these things. A whole bunch are, in, I know you said don't get into wellness, but they literally, there's a chapter in the latest IPC report called Wellness X and Y. I forget what it's called. And a lot of the stuff in there, but also in other scattered about other chapters is comes out of a psychological literature, a sort of weird mm. social psychological literature. And if you work your way back, you find these weird studies. Uh, and I, again, I, I, can I ask you guys if you had ever encountered those thinkers, like whether it's like uh, Aaron Antonovsky or like Emmy Werner or Garmezi, Norman Garmezi or any of these weird American psychologists? I'm familiar with some of this stuff from like the positive psychology traditions and I'm yes, familiar with it. It yeah. eventually gets repurposed as positive psychology. Yeah, I'm familiar with the ideas, um, not with those yeah. particular because Thinkers. these guys, so one of the reasons I, I hone in on this, and this is a long way to get back to your, your question and also to Pat, um, as I was reading this stuff, I was trying to find like, where are these ideas coming from? Because they are weird. Because like all of a sudden you would find this like weird interjection in the IPCC report that refers to some weird think tank report or some weird psychological or some weird study that is in the natural sciences, but drawing on a, a cycle, what they consider to be uh, like, oh, that's the proven psychological case. Right. And so I was like, okay, I want to see what these psychological cases are. That sounds fascinating. All right. Um, and discovered that they, uh, this is again, very recent. So, right. I talked before about using kind of the Google Ngram sort of bullshit method, but at least I didn't do two words at once. It was just like, look at resilience and look yeah. at explosion. And most of that post 70s explosion is not in natural scientific literature. In fact, mostly it is in this uh, social scientific and think tank and policy space. And this drove me 
to find the sort of origins of this stuff, which I really sort of trace two tracks of. One is in American, uh, I'm calling it social psychology, but honestly, I don't really know what to call it because I actually have more positive views on some social psychology than this stuff. So people like, this is like Emmy Werner and, oh, I forgot her writing partner's name, um, who did the longitudinal study on children in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's other folks that I, I think are only in the notes. So people like uh, Norman Garmezi is one of my favorites because this guy, like, I think in his own mind, probably in the mid fifties, thought of himself as like, a left-leaning American, like New Deal Democrat kind of guy, but is like, oh, sorry, this is some of this stuff. It's late fifties and sixties, and but then he will literally talk about res like developing resilience theory in opposition to people acting out, yeah. right? The ability to sort of take in these pressures and these stretches, and then like, it's like I mean, it sounds like weird, like British, but like like old or like German building stuff, you know, like this, like kind of like this will like shape your soul into yeah. being a hard, a hardy human being. And hilariously, this stuff, there's a tradition of this stuff that runs to today. Uh, the guy I found most recently writing about stuff like this is uh, George Bonanno, mm -hmm. who <laughs> literally writes like handbooks for resilience for cops yep. and will also argue against um, distribution of resources on like on like the kind of welfare ground, right? Oh, it's going to make people dependent on handouts as opposed to developing. And, and this is where I think where it gets super creepy, like a lot of things that sound kind of nice, right? Like, oh, they are not going to be an autonomous self-governing community. They're not going to have the skills and the resources to I mean, he doesn't say pick him up, but actually he basically does. He does say pick him up a bullshit bootstraps. But in this early literature, it is shocking. The other source that I trace, and I actually saw it because it's even more shocking, is um, Aaron Antonovsky. Uh, uh -huh. And he's an Israeli medical sociologist. Uh, and his wife was a, a, a social psychologist. So in the Werner study, she studies children, uh, at-risk youth, I guess would be category, right? over time and her initial thesis, right? This is like when social science mimics science, right? The thesis is very sort of like social science journal, duh, right? Like if I do not, if I look at this population that lacks access to resources and institutions that will like, you know, have good schools and hospitals and right, then mothers will suffer. And subsequently the children of those mothers will suffer. I mean, that seems true and punchline uh, right for her study uh, is that it is true right she found this was the case for overwhelming uh, majority of 75 percent of her patients if they had access to good social support quality resources right public goods they did well and most that did not did poorly mm -hmm. now there was a special chunk and she has this wonderful phrase that I think is now popularized, right? She calls it the vulnerable but invincible children. These are the children of people. Um, and again, this is mostly, I don't think I mentioned this before, but right, the at-risk youth category here in Hawaii is a combination of the children of indigenous Hawaiians and of immigrants largely from East Asia. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, you all there seems to be this amazing cohort of the vulnerable but invincible that are these children who have no access to anything, but they do well. And instead of focusing on the vast majority, uh, instead, the exciting thing for her, for herself and her colleagues, I can almost even see why this could be interesting in an intellectual way. And if you're bracketing out society, right? <laughs> like, what makes these kids tick? Like, right. how do they work? And so, and they how can we all be like yeah. them? Never mind the children buried behind the residential school. Let's talk about these. <laughs> striving up and coming winners. There, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the uh no 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 because uh, and then no i do want to get stuff like that but yes it, it um they reach back and cite antonovsky right and initially antonovsky has the same right he's a so medical sociologist to find this kind of concept that he calls sense of coherence which now you can find in these weird like policy books and 
guides to disaster management. I had a, a disaster management specialist at, at a talk I was giving last night, and she and I were really just trading like all the anecdotes we had read in this stuff. And yeah, talking about how it's clearly like even for a disaster manager, she's like, this is horseshit. So she, they reach back to people like Antonovsky and find this concept of sense of coherence mm -hmm. that is there's a set of internal dispositions mm -hmm. that we can develop, right? And those internal dispositions, oh God, I didn't write them all down, but it's roughly like, I affirm that the world makes sense. I assume that I always have the resources available to meet any challenge. I am hopeful and optimistic. I mean, this you can sort of hear it already. I yeah, can't do all, the I, whole litany. Get, get These internal uh, resources. Uh, and he hedges this in his early work and then gets very hardcore in the later stuff. It, like, are what makes the difference. And if the Hawaii story wasn't horrifying enough for listeners, uh, and they can read it in the, in the excerpt that you mentioned, the Antonovsky story is he is studying all these women, right, in Israel predominantly Jews. I do think there were non-Jews in the study, but that's another story. And the study was, in fact, not on any of this stuff. In fact, he was not a psychologist. He was very suspicious of doing psychology. Menopause, what? right? This is the one that's it on, was on menopause. Yeah. 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 It was his wife who really, actually, it's one of these things where like, she deserves more credit, but I don't want to like besmirch her with this terrible idea. Um, like she's the one who came up with like the surveys, making this into a psychological survey. Yeah. Um, that was her idea, not his. But he was the one who initially had this sort of vulnerable thing, but it was for fucking concentration camp survivors. So he's surveying all these thousands and thousands, I believe. I have the number in the book of Israeli women who are going through menopause. And one of the questions is, did you just, he's just, they're just making a sociological survey, right? So he's just like, oh, well, an interesting variable to measure would be concentration camps. Were you in the camps? And it, so in the sub division of the camps people, he finds again that, and this is why Werner reaches back and cites it for her psychological work. He finds basically the same ratio, right? A shock of all shocks. People, if you live through a concentration camp, you don't, and you don't die, there's a decent chance you will be fucked up for life. Right. That is what the, like, again, I, I seem this is blowing no one's mind. But it, what did, and he literally has this whole thing, he narrates it. You can read his books. They're so weird. And he's like, what was truly extraordinary, what blew my mind, what my colleagues and I could not understand was this subsection of people who could literally be uh, like subjected to the most deprivation you can basically imagine and get by. Yeah. And this becomes part, and you know, he calls it salutogenesis, which I, whatever. Uh, but, right, these, both Werner uh, and her writing partner, again, who I forget, people like, uh, oh, the Garmezi example is also wonderful because he basically says, like, acting out, right, is also includes, like, one of the examples he gives of acting out at, of urban youth is students of his who are getting political. Yeah. Or joining like political clubs and stuff like this, right? These are all given as examples of not being resilient then, right? right? So uh, Antonovsky avoids the word for a while. These other people really eventually just dive right into it. Right. And resilience here becomes this ideal and it shifts over time, this complicated stuff, but long and the short of it, socially, it's the it's idea that, and this is there already in Antonovsky's work at the beginning, that there's always stressors. That's true, by the way. Of course there are. But that there's always disease. There's always everything. And there's basically nothing you can do about it. And so what you need to help people do is develop these dispositions, right? These special, the vulnerable and invincible or the, or the like concentration camp survivor, right? And the way I usually jokingly describe this, it, I don't think I put it in the piece, maybe I should have, is it's like, how many times can you get punched in the gut, but still like function? And they're like, okay, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can get punched 47 times. All right. And like the question we're not asking is like, please stop punching me in the goddamn gut. Like that would be nice. 
I, think, so, I mean, that's I think like is, hand history. I think this is a good moment for me to read for our listeners a couple snippets of your critique of resilience now with a little bit of the history in view and see if we can we can get into this. Okay, so I'm quoting from this this chapter, which is also the Baffler excerpt. In its common use, resilience is easy to understand. It is the capacity of ecosystems, individuals, communities, or societies, quote, exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate to, and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions, close quote. Resilience is therefore about risk shifting, minimum resource levels, and bouncing forward. Resilience emphasizes some of the stickiest, socially destructive ideals of our time. The hardy survivor, the endlessly flexible and adaptable worker, and the self-reliant community, all of whom continue to function within even the most corrosive socio-ecological conditions and deprivations. This is part of why resilience is so beloved by policymakers. In a crisis-ridden world, it counsels quiescence and parsimonious austerity. Even in its most general formulations, it looks for just how little some unit, a body, a region, a population, might need, while avoiding the possibility of significant external change entirely. Resilience is a management strategy and apology for the status quo, for global capitalism with all its constitutive social and socio-ecological relations. In resilience thinking, chaos, disease, and stress are omnipresent and often unavoidable naturally. Resilience thinking teaches the absolute limit of risk or stress that can be shifted onto individuals and communities, like a Victorian viceroy counting calories for coolies. And simultaneously, it shows that should such a limit prove too much for these poor souls, it is a failure of internal capacities. Nothing could be done. They were perhaps, in the phrasing of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, a disposable population to begin with. Resisting, absorbing, accommodating, and recovering. All socially passive and politically inert rely, as two resilience specialists summarize, on the cultivation of, quote, optimism, intelligence, creativity, humor, and a belief system that provides existential meaning, a cohesive life narrative, and an appreciation of the uniqueness of oneself, close quote. This is quite literally the prescription of ideology. As Theodore Adorno once quipped, there is humor because there is nothing to laugh at. So, okay, close quote. <laughs> that's, that's the close quote Adorno, close On quote Teddy. Ajay. Um, so, obviously, Ajay, you have a withering critique of resilience as a personal and political ideal. And I think that may, in some ways, as, as Patrick was foreshadowing before, yeah. come into conflict with... Let me just say, like the idea of psychoanalysis, since we're since we're on we're on this show talking about psychoanalysis, it it might come into conflict with some of our intuitions about, oh, let's say the desire to restore someone to greater mental health than they previously oh, enjoyed, and you know Patrick's example also of the clinician who is spending eight hours a day working um, with people who are suffering and are trying, you know, or it doesn't have to be a mental health worker. It can be anybody. And, you know, there's so many different, you know, you could think about EMTs. You could think about anyone Absolutely. in the medical establishment. Um, and even, you know, all three of us are teachers, right? Yep. Um, which is as much an emotional as it is an intellectual task um, Absolutely. most days. So I don't think, if I'm reading you correctly, I don't think you're saying it's better for us to just all fall apart. <laughs> oh God, no. Right? Oh, I hope no one thinks I want to tease that. out and be able and, and see if we can kind of thread this needle. And you know, because you know, I'm I'm thinking now about like when I get things, I'm sure I get something from HR or wellness every single week that's like, how do you build work on your resilience? And it pisses me off and I delete it and then I think about the ways in which the burden 
of keeping the self functioning has come in completely offloaded to the individual without social supports. And those are all the things that, that I get upset about when I think about resilience, but I also want to feel like a coherent individual. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) Absolutely. So I want to see if we can thread the needle. Yeah. Thread this needle um, and, and flesh out the things that are particularly pernicious about the valorization of resilience without saying that what you're calling for is something that I know that you're not, namely like a kind of vision of of the self that doesn't have that kind of of structure and purpose. If I might, uh, uh, something to put on the table here, I think that might be helpful would be to think about this question about like, what do we want both like what, what's at stake in the critique of resilience and we're describing the way in which it's weaponized in terms of, I guess we could say the extractive circuit and yeah. more on that in a yeah. second, uh, but also how what we would talk about or what we would seek to cultivate in let's call it like a genuine resilience or like some sort of, well, what we're trying to gesture at here is like a, a human capacity um, might be describable in terms of the rhetoric, but also the mystifications of the rhetoric of realism and what's realistically possible that we talked about earlier. Right? And to tie a tight bow on this, right, what, what I'm thinking about, like, is essentially what we've described, to, to use terms that you already have in the book and in your very yeah, sophisticated of use of uh, of, uh, of affect theory, and I, I think, you know, a little bit of an economy as well, right? Like, the individual is a node in this extractive circuit. Yes. Right. And, yes, and yes, you, yes. you get burned the fuck out. Um, right. Yes. Your labor is extracted. We can think you're working with Jung Han and all this stuff where it's like, not only are you encouraged, or not only, not only is labor extracted from you by your boss, but you're supposed to check in after hours. And, and also the things that you do for leisure also look like work, whether it's World of Warcraft stuff or it's, you know, uh, p- posts, which can themselves be monetized, but are also a type of self-optimization. You're, you're, you know, Byung Han will call you a project instead of a subject, right? You're always exploited. It's really, really bad. That's you in the extractive circuit. You are effectively burned out. And, and that is because of institutions that are, again, like hollowing you out, ideological apparatuses that are encouraging you to hollow yourself out yet further, and also institutions that are are, are failing you yes. too. Other institutions that could be there to care for you are failing. They're being withdrawn in this neoliberal framework, et cetera, et cetera right? Yes. So at that point, enter the fantasy of resilience as essentially a like it's an externality to the reproduction of these systems but it is essentially a discipline of i think your mindfulness is a lot of this work too right it's like a part of that toolkit it's a resource that the individual can cultivate from like wellsprings of within over and against that sort of either the the exploitation of other institutions or the neglect of other institutions to somehow buoy themselves up in and not only like patch the damage that's been done to them by those institutional failures or those institutional like active exploitations, but then arrive refreshed in a way that's not zero sum, ready to work again. Yes. And in that sense, it very neatly flows into this, well, one, as you described, like a violence of like privileging survivors, right? Like the people who are capable of, all the people who show up for work and are not cry, crying in their office. <laughs> you call it violence. I would call it a valorization, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, it's, a, yeah it's a sort of a twisted survivorship bias, but also, and this is, like, I think, a very nice psychoanalytic logic to it, right? It proves it as a system, it proves itself because everyone who shows up and thus demonstrates resilience means that the system is still okay, right? <laughs> yeah. So, th- yes. Oh, my God. To put it in terms of the, realist, the realism stuff, just finally, right? It's like, it's like we have discovered or are postulating superhuman, unrealistic, individual energistic resources, That's which right. can be cultivated and tapped as though they were a natural resource to ease over the dysfunctions and the unsustainability or the lack of resilience or the brittleness of these institutions of exploitation, extraction, and compulsion. And I think this is also why it makes sense that Ajay is so appalled at um, the direction that the two researchers that you're looking at take, which is not sort of what's happening to the vast majority of people who, who shatter in some ways under yes, under yes, conditions yes, yes. that make people shatter, but that actually look towards this very narrow band of people that will seemingly flourish 
despite everything and then treat that as proof of concept yes. in some ways yes. for yes. what yes. Yes. all yes. human beings should be able yes. to do. I just want to underscore back to you too, the way in which all this comes about during the 60s, right? In which the 50s and 60s, in which there is this, both a faith in and a terror of the capacity of ideologized science to like rebuild the person uh, and over and like overcome like their individual energistic resources or needs or like basic survival instinct, i.e. in like the, the, the terror of North Korean or Soviet quote unquote brainwashing, right? And all the MK ultra shit on the other, you know, that we're doing stateside. And in both cases, it's sort of like, the flip side or the, the conjoined aspect of what Abby just described and what you're describing is that the, this entire study of let's help people, let's determine what resilience is and let's promulgate resilience as like a positive project can also be framed from the position of the inertia of power and the extractive circuit as let's determine precisely how far we can extract from people and have them get recharged again. Let's see how far we can push it. If people can do this in the concentration camps, God damn it, we can get more bang for our buck in our workplaces too. Yeah, it's so funny the way Abby was presenting it and I got so, like, so horrified immediately because absolutely in no way, shape or form uh, do I encourage at all. I am someone who relies on all kinds of treatments and medications of a myriad the number of pretty gnarly diseases that I have. <laughs> so it's just the way it is, right? Yeah. So in no way, shape or form, am I making some kind of like that sort of like anti-psychiatry thing where it's like, if I need help, I shouldn't get it. Or like, I, I was shouldn't not, I, I shouldn't I don't, get, no, no, I knew you weren't saying that, no. but I do want like listeners to be clear. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to do that at all. And in fact, uh, you know, I did, you know, we talked about Fanon earlier, again, part of his realism, his pragmatism, whatever you want to call it, is in fact that, again, that he is not dismissive of his patients being sick. Right. And he right. gets that more, that like grand theoretical argument that it's society is sick. And this then hooks into sort of pre-existing, you know, dispositions in our psyches and whatnot. But it doesn't mean then don't have treatment. In fact, he has very long, interesting writings about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are these sort of like big thinkers, right, uh, hovering over myself, so Fanon, Marx, Benjamin. Uh, one of them is, is Berlant. And, you know, when I was thinking yeah. about, Abby, what you were saying, uh, I was thinking, do you ever, do you ever, I think you probably almost certainly read this, but uh, forgive me if you didn't, but uh, Risky Bigness. By Berlant? Yeah. No? It's a chapter in, well, I'll say what it is then. Uh, Rissy Bigness is an article they wrote um, for a collection called Against Health. Mm. And, uh, the first line that they wrote in that is, I'm not against health, not even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and I feel the same exact way on this. Like, I'm not against, uh, like, <laughs> getting help <laughs> for one's uh, either individual uh, like your pains, your daily pains, whether those be, uh, as I say in the book, like bodily pain and fatigue or, you know, mental stuff like this. But, uh, and I love the way you use the word ideal. When this gets turned into the ideal, like that's the end game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's not just the end game for the human, right? For the individual, but it's the end game for society, right? Is Is this, that's when you're like, and 10 eyes should go up. And you're like, wait a minute, what the fuck? I'm really happy you picked this excerpt and bought in the sort of, and Patrick, I think this piece speaks to what you were raising about the extractive circuit as well. Um, this question of risk shifting. Yeah. Um, because uh, this is a term I keep borrowing, something I do in the book, I don't know if it works or not, I hope it does, uh, is like borrowing other disciplines terms and using them where they don't belong, essentially, right? So I talk a lot in about structural adjustment programs for the individual. There's that long discussion of, of a, I have these two imaginary characters that I use to like animate my story. Like one of them is like a middle class. So very much, frankly, I have to admit, very much like us, right? A middle class intellectual worker. I characterize this as a, like, I make her up. She's a theoretical Californian. Maybe she's like an accountant or an office assistant or a coder, right? These are all 
common positions in the United States. We have a largely service economy, right? And even like by the numbers, she's doing really well, right? Life's not so bad, um, except you start drilling into it and her life's pretty hard. <laughs> she's not getting paid much. Her expenses are through the roof. So I go through all this stuff and the OECD stuff, but also she doesn't have enough time in a day. Right. Part of her resilience is relying on this second character. I talk about this displaced Filipino woman. Um, and I'll come back to her in a moment, right? So part of what she does to be resilient, so like in her office place, for example, now I'm mixing different parts of the book. Maybe there's like one of those funny things. I know Amazon does this. I think in several airports do this now where there's like a box called the mindfulness box. You guys know about this? <laughs> yeah. And is that it's a like, thing from Hook where they throw the scorpions in and <laughs> <laughs> I never know what I'm serious I'm supposed to respond to. Uh, I mean, no, no, no. It's, it's the part in Dune. It's the box where you you put your finger in and it's, in, <laughs> and it's you just experience pure pain the... and you yeah. can't move because the gum jabar is at your neck. Oh, yeah. You mean a, a Dyson ha- hand dryer. Yeah, yeah. I use those all the time. <laughs> That's like gross. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. no, the mindfulness box. Go ahead. Tell every, tell our box. listeners about the mindfulness That's box. almost the comical version, right? It's like, you're like, can I please have more, like, like this job is hard, mm-hmm. right? Uh, my wife, who you guys know, Dania, right, mm-hmm. uh, did a lot of work with Amazon warehouse workers. Yes. This is hard fucking work. Yeah. And so people will be like, we need breaks. We need to slow the line down. Yeah. We need better. And actually, the wages are all right, but whatever. They need what they need. And they're expressing that need. Human and needs. what this yeah. response is, oh, you can take five minutes in the mindfulness box. <laughs> and, like, and like, I guess, like, recover briefly. And like, the, the charm of, of me for the, of the mindfulness box is actually... It, on both these levels, first, it, like that is way worse than I don't know, getting therapy or other forms of psychological treatment. It is also way hilarious to face a sort of basic social demand, like I want a safe workplace with the like, oh no, 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 you can think your way out of this problem. It's like no, 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 no. No matter how mindful I get in that box, like the assembly line still running too fast. Sorry, the delivery yeah. line is still running too fast. Outside the so, box thinking is when you're like, get me out of this box. <laughs> I want to die in here. Get me out. Put me back into work. And, you know, something, you know, the other giant, one of the other giant literatures that people will probably not expect that I drew on for this book, uh, right? It, like all this natural scientific stuff, right? Uh, not usual for a critical theory and a you know, like anti-colonialism guy like me. Uh, but I, it was very important and very, uh, but one of the others are these sort of in, it, like inside baseball industry journals. And also these like business management texts. And they are hilarious on this shit because they do see burnout as a huge problem yeah. in places like our like the United States. And it's like, they, you know, it's a, well, I forget what the joke is, but it's like they get so close to being like, this is untenable. There's no way to solve this. And then it's like, oh, no, there's six things. It's like, welcome to my TED Talk. You can meditate. You can do this. You can do this and somehow get better. And we ended there on Teddy, right? On on um, my old friend Adorno, who I feel like is you know so often besmirched. Not in these parts. Not in these parts. Cool. Part of the argument that I think is often missed in Adorno's writings on culture, in particular the culture industry, but a lot of the other, uh, in particular, no, the culture industry I think is probably the best place he does. It's been a morality as well. It's actually not so much the uh, what I think is the caricature. It's the same thing with Fanon, right? The caricature is. We should only listen or like engage with high art. Uh, low art is bullshit. Um, hot, and mass art is like encoded with these like secret messages of ideology, right? Uh, now, there's parts that are, I can see why people get that. But fundamentally, the argument there, and so this just shows that this has been a, around for a while. It's, it's one of these things that in teaching critical theory, I have found resonates stronger today than it did 20 years ago. Because part of the argument there is, in fact, right, A, uh, as Pat intimated earlier, we mimic the work process in our off time. So uh, I don't know if we're talking pop culture stuff and stuff like this, but you raised like a game like um, Helldivers in our pre-show chat, right? Or any number of these sort of platform shows. I know you're a big Call of Duty player. Uh, not really my jam, but okay. <laughs> Ironically, those kinds of entertainments, and I love video games, but I am often very cognizant of this thing. 
where uh, you are literally doing like a, a replication of the work process. <laughs> like you're like, oh, I need to mine X amount of Y and I must budget it. And uh, like when uh, there've been a couple of game experiences, I have like spreadsheets. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing with you my goddamn free time? spreadsheets for video games? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, all have We talked yeah. about this in our games? Elden Ring totally. podcast. Yeah. I require because th those games are so hard. I required this like I don't massive even have amount of data. For my actual job. Well, you have to have a different build for different tasks, oh. and yeah, uh, you got to remember, I'm a professional manager now for ten years. I, <laughs> right? so I, I, I know. I just, I, I mean, I do have spreadsheets, but I avoid them. I cannot possibly imagine doing that in my free time. The, the long and the short of the Teddy part, right? Is the uh, like. Yes, we either mimic the work process or often we do things that we know aren't that awesome or we convince ourselves are kind of awesome. And it's not about the quality of the art. It actually is about a way of sort of recuperation so that you can be better the next day, right? So that, And that was an old argument, you know, roughly late 40s, early 50s, mm -hmm. right? And Today, I think this could not even be more vital and more and more powerful because a lot, so much of our, I mean, part of the argument about colonization is not only about geographic spread of, of, of colonization, it's the colonization of time, it's the colonization of space, it's the colonization of all kinds of things, but in particular time, right? I mean, whose joke is it? I think it's, oh God, Jonathan Crary is a lit scholar, not a site scholar, who like, it's like if they could sell ads to your brain while you sleep, they would do it, right? Like, um, two of the weirdest studies I cite in this book are about uh, extracting value from refugees. Uh, and one of the, and this is again, in pure economics, not even getting into geopolitics where they just use as a lever, uh, but it's like testing out app data. This is a real thing that apparently has happened in these, some of these camps particularly in Europe, uh, I don't know about the US, we're actually more tight-lipped about our stuff, but right, they'll like test out. It's like, oh, we've got a bunch of people. Great. Use this app and we'll get some data and we'll see if it does X, Y, and Z. So that's one way. And another way can be like, oh, great. So you don't have a state and you don't have any way of making money and you're stuck here in this camp. Well, we'll put you into the informal economy, right? Mm -hmm. And you can roughly do this, this, and this, but you get paid tiddlywinks. What you're describing here is, is so pure on a continuum with what you also described, which is namely not just refugees from conflict zones, but people literally who are in conflict zones and whose life or death is obviously existential for them, but is also an arena for people to product test weapons, as we yes. are seeing in multiple theaters right now. But the thing I want that I think comes before that and that is so important here is that Burnout is real. Exhaustion is real. When I say exhaustion is precise, uh, this is something I try to map out along the extractive circuit, right? If, along the world, the capitalism as we know it. And there, are, and as I, we talked about earlier, there's many different forms of it. But why resilience is so, why I take such strong swings at it. Again, not so that people don't get help, but rather that we not see it as the horizon of our, like, our emancipation, of our freedom. Yeah. Or I don't even get like, that grandiose in this book because it's meant to be very, uh, very focused on climate and very focused on sort of imperfection and what we can do imperfectly now, right? Uh, and like burnout is really real and exhaustion is really real. I can't stress this enough. So some of the examples I use in the book are, you know, drugs. So like, What's the great innovation of Walmart? Uh, uh, listeners may not know this, right? The great innovation of Walmart is you don't you don't use as much warehouses. You keep the uh, products on the road continuously, based probabilistically on where they will end up, right? Okay. Um, so a this clearly means you're constantly burning huge amounts of gas. Yeah, you get it, right? I don't even want to get into international shipping, which by the way is not counted as in carbon budgets by the UNFCCC, but whatever. Right. So one of the examples I look to is is all the stimulants that, in fact, truck drivers, it's it's stimulants and then also painkillers that truck yeah. drivers. Uh, and here it's not, I'm not only using USA, you use a lot of data from places like Brazil, I think India, a few other places where people, yeah, are like are everything from like the most prosaic, I don't know, nicotine, right? Smoking. But like all the way up to like 
you know, cocaine, meth, et cetera, right? And at the same time, right, uh, again, this sort of same game I keep playing between the sort of different figures in different social positions. That woman I was describing in California, you know, she probably needs uh, help keeping that pace of life up. That could be anything from, you know, oh God, I don't know how personal to get on these things, but right, sleeping pills. Uh, And again, amphetamines, but hers would come in a nice plastic bottle. It's dispensed by the uh, pharmacy, theoretically, but the DAA apparently doesn't want that to happen right now. But right, like, in the book, I talk about this more about the Filipina immigrant uh, who similarly um, of Filipina domestic worker who is a migrant um, who uh, I talk. I, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. Right uh, there um, where I should be talking about psychology, I use a political economy phrase. Right. It's a structural adjustment program. Right. right? She has mm-hmm. to do these things to get by. And it's very similar for the all these other folks. And. I think that this is where it comes back to your point, Ben, right? This is the sort of individualized, and I think actually here I'll borrow from other sociological sources, atomized, right? This is more Zemalian than it is Marxian, right? These sort of like atomized uh, solutions to problems that actually are largely social in origin, but that does not bracket that these are genuine problems. And the place, it's funny because it makes total sense to me that um, I totally like jump from the individual to the political unit. And I'm like, because I don't think individuals are themselves political units. So I immediately, just because I'm such a politics guy, start thinking about group dynamics. Because the thing I warn about in that end of that section, I'm not sure if this got cut from the baffler version or not, because it is shorter than the full right. version. Is like, of course, there's going to be exhaustion in your movement. There's going to be burnout in your movement. This is normal. This happens with all kinds. I mean, God, this is real. However, if you have suddenly turned resilience into your ideal as a movement, then it's just you've like lost sort of sight of the plot. This is so useful. This is so wonderful as an ideological thing, as a policy thing. And this, I think, you both raised the connection to the resilience of natural science studies. Mm. This often bleeds back into that, where, again, people with very good intent. One of those quotes there is from some people I really respect. Uh, again, you talked about, Abby, you talked about medical professionals. Medical professionals, especially since COVID, but actually long before this, this has been very high yeah. on their mm-hmm. uh, agendas because people are completely overwhelmed. Absolutely. But we shouldn't lose sight that, right, they're overwhelmed because we don't, for example, in this country, treat healthcare work, especially at levels lower than sort of specialized doctors. So uh, a lot of this literature I've read is from registered nurses. A lot of it is from EMTs Mm -hmm. and all kinds of folks uh, or people who do other work but are just very aware of their colleagues' travails that are like, this is a major problem and then sadly, though, they end up turning to this other literature and like, okay, we got to cultivate these dispositions. I'm like, no, 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 you're so close. You're so close. It's like, we actually have to have a functioning health system. <laughs> like, and then maybe some of this other stuff, maybe it helps. I don't know. That's for a professional. In those fields, it's so, so, so vital. And it's exactly the same in, in when you see it in the natural science discourses. So often when I see that, Uh, ironically, it is amongst uh, people who are often trying to do the bridging work between the sort of natural scientific and some kind of justice oriented. And I actually don't, I bracket out a lot of justice frames, which is a complicated argument, actually goes back to the realism, but like justice oriented work and will land on resilience and, and end up doing studies. I described, I think one, I can't remember if it's in the main text or if it's in a footnote. Again, a woman who I knew as being, and she unfortunately passed, but she, as I knew, is very well-intentioned, very good person, excellent research. Like, I'm not calling into question her expertise or her research at all. But the way in which this idea from the social psychological literature or from the gray literature, right, think tank literature, sort of plays back in is she's like, okay, I am looking at, and I think, Abby, this is what you're referencing, right? Like a, a coastal community in Bangladesh, or I think, oh no, it's forest management. It's also South Asia, but it's forest management. And in the forest management study, uh, it, it it's like 
well, the current pro things we're doing around logging and, and yada, yada, yada are disrupting this local community. Oh, there is a flooding aspect to it. So that's why I was mixing up. Uh, and it's then uh, making it more susceptible to erosion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a huge problem and we should focus on it. Part two is, okay, I looked at the social science literature and apparently what they say we should do <laughs> is we should look at who has these sense of coherence principles, right? And so all of a sudden, and you know, this is, again, it sounds really nice. And I think the policy people are a little more aware of what they're doing. And I think this is more of like an innocent mistake. Where So the researcher will go and be like, okay, look at this guy. He could not uh, recover his house. Uh, the foundations eroded, et cetera. And his livelihood was lost and his family was decimated and he could not recover. But look at this woman. She managed to pull it off. Same village, same thing, right? And they're following what they think and they have no reason not to think is the scientific consensus on uh, society and psychology. Well, I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is something like all of the problems that resilience purports to solve are real. Oh, yes. But to answer them with resilience is fundamentally a form of misdirection. Yes. Is that right? I mean, absolutely. Especially as, again, I don't think I actually used the word in the book, but it's your word uh, that I am now like really hooked on. I think it's a perfect way. It's thinking of it as an ideal. That really is the one that I'm stuck on or yeah. hooked on because I think that one gets it. Like that really, really, really gets it. Because instead of us asking, well, what could we like actually do for this community? Instead of us looking at, now the joke, right? Outside the box. Instead of us looking at society, instead of us considering all these things, uh, we're only going to focus on this, right? So if we're, um, there's a joke in, in climate literature about, about carbon tunnel vision, which is actually is a huge problem, right? You only talk about carbon, you don't talk about anything else. Yeah. Um, this is sort of, I guess, like, uh, yeah, uh, resilience tunnel vision, right? So I only am focusing in the end on psychological dispositions. Again, many, many other studies that use this pot in a really good way will also talk about, like, I don't think that much water and that much road are going to mix so well. You know, some of this stuff is very real. And yes, as you said, like, the individual psychological things are very real. And again, I would never, the, uh, one of the other figures I, I cite a lot in the book, next to these towering giants is, is Mark Fisher. Uh -huh. And, yeah. you know, I think he also like really struggled, he struggled personally with a lot of, uh, of mental health problems and was very much personally situated at, uh, in his thought around how uh, so much of mental health and in fact, he used mental health and climate as two examples where coming back to this kind of language that Pat was using with more psychology, where, you know, reality impinges upon the the ideological real or whatever however it works right um that these are places where we can see almost that the entire system does exactly the opposite of what it says and i don't just mean this in ideological terms but right i say this in the book right like what is the plain description of what we are supposed to have with 21st century capitalism whether we want to use the phrase neoliberalism other things like this whatever people can do whatever they want we're supposed to have efficiency. We're supposed to have ease. We're supposed to have lack of bureaucracy. You're supposed to have, right? Everything's supposed to be this kind of like, finally, we're free and all this kind of stuff. But instead, you see this like grinding misery and irrationality, deep inefficiency, intense, thick bureaucracy that gets even thicker the worse off you are, right? This is the classic. It's very busy to be poor. It's very expensive to be poor. Oh, very expensive to be poor. I guess I was mixing the two. So that's my spin on it. I also deeply appreciated about this, the way in which your book both surveys the material and the empirical and the numerical and the libidinal and, and the effective and the qualitative is that as an enterprise in and of itself, it's not exhausting to read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, I hope no, not. It, it, it's not. And it, also it, the way you use Fanon is so interesting insofar as that, well, like, 
you draw on Fanon's sort of theory of disalienation or more specifically the way in which he feels that internal psychic suffering, which is a product of social conditions, needs to be externalized, needs to be expressed, uh, represented in the world, enacted in the world, but also transformed in the world if there's going to be any hope of both, both of health, but also uh, you have a lovely line, which I... I, I wish I could quote offhand, but about how essentially the end of therapy is politics, right? Or, 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 or what? Well, for point? him, it yeah, very practically was, yeah. 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 And, and I appreciate too that you have a very sophisticated reading of Fanon that essentially is is realist in the sense that not only you see him as not celebrating violence, like, but rather simply acknowledging its inevitability, yeah. and rather than sort of as many people who will. You know, in this heart, in this the the um, armed lifeboat camp, will will we'll sneer at him and take him <laughs> as a proof that the barbarians are at the gate, right? Whereas, in fact, he seems to indicate that this is a that well, actually, maybe we can tie this in directly with resilience. That like even as the colonizer enjoins people to take out their to t- basically take a time out, and I, yes. I have to tell you, I, I looked up the, the 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 product language for the the Amazon mindfulness space, and it's all about taking a time out taking a breather so you can peruse a library of mindful te- techniques and recharge your batteries. Yeah. And there's a computer there, which presumably is watching you while you do this. So you, you can't do drugs or masturbate or whatever else it is you might do in there. Right. The point here though, right. <laughs> is that what I love, what I love about what you're it doing. It does sound like a good place to do drugs, doesn't it? Yeah. I, you'd imagine that this is probably where you would like have a vape pen, but in any event also just like, can you imagine how terrible mindfulness must smell? But that's another matter entirely. Ask your question, Patrick. Yeah. And in your appeal to Fanon, which is at once deeply empathetic, but also realistic in terms of understanding like a whole, a great many mechanisms, you essentially tell us that like, we, we can't resilience our way out of either terminal capitalism yes, or that's right. out of the human suffering and rage that is coming or, or that is already here, but that also the, the extension of these tendencies that we've already talked about to their logical conclusion will inevitably provoke. And in this weird way, or in this paradoxical way, exhaustion, even if if we have a robust enough concept of it, as we as we do, thanks to your work, and that allows us to distinguish between subject positions in it, exhaustion in this way actually becomes a type of fed upness, right? Or at least as a grounds for solidarity towards potentially yes, good, very, overcoming very good. something. And so, so I what, really appreciate. Yeah. So, so I, okay. I like this. Like you evacuate resilience. Yes. And turn exhaustion on its head for purposes of a political emancipation, or at least for, for yes. as, as a propedeutic towards political action. Yes. So yes, the whole point, in fact, and, uh, and this ties in really well with what Abby was prompting as well, um, of the whole resilience critique is in fact to launch into uh, what I quote from Fanon as this argument of externalization. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, which literally for him is just, it's politics, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, and in fact, a lot of, I think part of maybe what I was missing earlier is how apolitical these sort of management stress, I mean, or a, actually not apolitical, they're deeply political, but they are the management they masquerade as apolitical. Yeah. But they're yeah. the management strategy of, of the status quo. and again, we all do it. We need to get back. Right. Right. And so that there's always the, right. I mean, not to quote Adorno two times, but right. Uh, (laughs) Wrong life can't be lived rightly. Right. Like you can't do perfect ethics in our, in the way our world works. And so I think that is also the cautionary for the people who are too, I guess, hepped up on the anti-psychiatry stuff. It's like, sometimes you need like, yeah, yes, it is a social problem, but you do need to actually address the individual solution, which is something Fanon does as well. But uh, as Pat was sort of just pushing, right, there's two other ways that resilience can go. So one uh, will be the Fanon introduction, which is where I think I'll land. But the other one is the one that actually Abby read, right, is the Gilmore one. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Ruthie Gilmore writes, right, her definition of racism is state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of proof differentiated vulnerability to premature death which later she characterizes as disposability. Right. Right. So if you are a, a sad, sadly, you are in the 75% of people who aren't vulnerable yet invincible, aren't the, can't live through Dachau and like get up the next day and are like, oh, I think I'll go get a job. 
right? Like if that's not you, like I'm going to, you know, make breakfast. That was a weird five years of my life. I, uh, you know, like whatever, Jesus right? Um, there is a way, I think this, this is why I said, I wanted to stick a pin in what you said before, Patrick, and maybe we, we should, we'll come back to that, right? When you got into like security and surveillance technologies and military strategies and that kind of stuff, Pat, well, I thought you were going there before, right? Is in fact, also you're like, well, they, these people failed and thus they're either disposable or if they get a little too icky, then you got to like, you know, apply some force and get rid of them. Right. But they were like not very good people to begin with. This stuff is really gnarly. It sounds like I'm saying like horrifying things. They are horrifying things, but they're very real. Again, read this kind of weird literature of like what captains of industry say to each other. And you'll actually see like Ruth, maybe Ruthie's definition feels like some weird theory thing. And then you'll be like, oh, wait, no. Uh, and again, this is not that new. Go, go back to read your Adam Smith, read your Marx. You see people uh, read your the weird shit they just discovered it like five years ago, Thomas Jefferson. People working out the calculations, like that part of the joke about Victorian viceroys counting calories. That shit's real, apparently. Uh, that happened in the colonial period uh, under the East India Company in India and, and, and under the Raj as well. But here in the US, it was often like, well, if I feed a slave X, I can get Y years. I think they theorize it as six. I believe Marx actually uses some of this stuff to be like, this is roughly the life that we tr- that capital will say is the reproducible life of a worker, right? So there is a lot of this older literature that deals with basically like people with minimum resources, how much function can you get out of them until you throw them away? And then on the flip side, the one I think is the more, to me, hopeful version um, is, and this is where the, like really the second half of the book goes, I think, is this externalization argument that Fanon makes that, right, that, as I said before, is to, in some ways, through all kinds of processes that could be um, processes of, that exist in political and social movements, right? Like filling in spaces where the state has not succeeded. So providing mutual aid, uh, support work, making sure people are able to do either the like formal work of politics or the clandestine work of like illegal politics. But also that one of the things that I think he's so important on, and this is a really nice place to sort of, I think, encapsulate this, is that when he is talking again about like his version of what I would call affect theory, um, he is grounding it very much in social position, but the feelings of these things bleed. They're not like always coherent. Um, They could be very inchoate, right? So what we see here, and and here I borrow not only on Fanon, but uh, Kathy Weeks, and who makes wonderful argument about standpoint philosophy and other things, it, the argument I make about exhaustion is like, look, this is what we're producing. Yeah. We're producing exhaustion. And one of the things that is useful about Fanon for me is A, and I've actually seen some people say this about myself. They're like, how can a bunch of exhausted people do stuff? Well, if I look at history, so I read my Fanon, I read my CLR genes, I read my Marx, I read any number of people. I can see historical accounts of people really work to the bone who are, or going through absolute misery and then still able to do something. I mean, look at the, the Russian Revolution is kind of that for the, on the soldier side. Uh, a bunch of things in the 20th century. I don't want to do a litany, right? So on the one hand, it's totally possible. But more importantly, I think when you start synthesizing stuff like Fanon with standpoint theory and stuff, stuff like this, you can think of these feelings as grounds in which like you and I, like Abby and I are not the same person, right? We have different things, different things. And we, even though we're very vaguely similar, right? We're both professors, et cetera, et cetera. We both live in the United States. We both speak English. I don't know, any number of things, right? But exhaustion could be a ground on which we can cross those boundaries by not obliterating what makes Abby distinctive from me, but rather creating some kind of sense of, of a shared ground and then hopefully connecting it to, to material causes, and then the antagonism of politics. And similarly, I think about this international, that exhaustion is something you see in, God, it's also just everywhere. It's in every book. It's in every, uh, I mean, literally, I don't just mean like these management texts. I just mean, it's just so everywhere. At one point I talked about how in Germany they've coined this hilarious phrase for like sicknesses of the time and, and exhaustion and burnout are considered them. WHO definition of exhaustion is just like the inability to go to work, <laughs> um, which is funny in and of itself. 
Um, you encounter this stuff everywhere, and you also see it in uh, non-Northern populations or in the pockets of what I call Global South and Global North. And that this, to me, is this kind of lateral politics, this lateral project of the relief of exhaustion is, in fact, also exactly what we need. It's not, you know, communism, it's not the class of society. It's not what I think many socialists and others want in the end. But it's this kind of sidestep that's like, yo, there's this whole other thing that we didn't notice. And in fact, 19th century theorists couldn't figure out that well. And actually, a lot of 20th century theorists couldn't figure out that well. And that we now have this very specific, tight, temporal line to do this political work that is kind of messy, but still like, I use a, a phrase from one of our colleagues, Rebecca Ariel Port, right? So this idea of a minor paradise, a sort of imperfect mm-hmm but possible utopias that are there, that are possible. And relief from that sort of speed up, the acceleration, relief from the extractive circuit, which causes all of these uh, feedbacks and uh, both ecological and social, what people want and need and express that they desire in this moment is that relief. And that is also what we need for genuine climate mitigation and adaptation. Jay, thank you so much for being here today. I am going to drop the link to the book and to the Baffler excerpt in the show notes. Um, But can you tell us about any upcoming talks, forthcoming writing, (laughs) anything you want (laughs) to offer up? First of all, people should always check out Bisser classes. I'm I'm teaching my politics climate change class now. But unfortunately, that is the enrollment period has ended. Um, it's also a full class. But um, there are a million other Bisser classes. Oh yeah, so people, I should have said where where can they yeah. classes that you're teaching? Yeah, yeah. So that no, it's good. I'm actually just looking. If I got that idea from your note sheet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then not currently doing a ton of writing. We did just uh, record. Um, something that I hope to come back and write about a podcast uh, on the other, on the Oakland Institute podcast, or one of our series on pop cultural Marxism. But um, it was me, Izzy, and Rebecca who guested from our other series, Practical Criticism. Um, and in that, we uh, so that should be coming out, I think, this weekend or next weekend. And it is uh, really fun because we change it from sustainable aesthetics into it's not easy being green. <laughs> and then in, in you know, uh, scare parentheses, whatever you would call that, uh, under capitalism. Um, and that's a, been a super, that was super fun. And so I love for, if people want to check that out, if you're interested in uh, questions about like, cultural production that is sustainable, not only in ecological senses, but also sustainable for their labor, right, for the production of them, uh, and also sustainable as like an aesthetic form, that they're actually interesting and fun. Those are all things we get into there. And then, you know, there's not too much time for writing right now, but I am working right now on, uh, I don't know where it's going to go, we'll see, a long review of the Dune movies. Jay, thank you so much for being here and for talking with us today. Um, it's really a pleasure. Oh, thank you. No, it's a total pleasure. Jay, it was one. I love the book. I read it cover to cover. I, I, I you hope did? It, yeah, I did. It's great. I, I, congratulations to you on it. It's quite an achievement, and I hope it does wonderfully. It was a joy to have you on. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, man. has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Patrick Blanchfield and Ajay Singh Chaudhary. This podcast is produced by Dan Yowell. Theme music by Formal Chicken. <laughs>